a barbecue hero with delicious, ultra-low net-carb hero bread, buns, and tortillas. Soft and fluffy, high in fiber, and with zero grams of sugar, up to 10 grams of protein, coming in at under 100 calories per serving. Oh, and did I mention they taste like their mouth-watering traditional versions? I mean, what's not to love? Use code AH10 for 10% off your first Hero Bread purchase at Hero.co. That's AH10 for 10% off at Hero.co. This is Make It Plain. Make It Plain. M.I.P. With Massimella Matsumo. Mark Thompson. Make It Plain. Get Woke. We know what day it is. We know it's our favorite time of the week. We know that it's time for the founder of Daily Coast and Civics with a Q, Marcos Melitsis, and the host of the brand new podcast, The Brief. Check it out. Marcos, how are you, buddy? Doing great. How are you doing, Mark? I'm okay. I'm okay. I was just in another conversation on a whole nother show uh, with uh, U911 uh, in California and what they've been dealing with and the legislation to see to it that workers who were let go are rehired first. But even that conversation is becoming clearer. Um, COVID is still pretty bad in Cali and um, this new strain oh, great. may be That's rearing great. Maybe rearing his ugly head. Talk yeah. to us about that from your perspective as a resident out there. And, it, and is the Bay Area still relatively calm? Bay Area, I think, may, uh, you know, when it's all said and done, I think we may be the least affected region of the country, not economically, uh, but as far as, as cases and death. San Francisco, when I last looked, had a grand total of maybe 200 dead. And it is the second most dense city in the entire country. This idea that cities are dangerous or it's at density. Now, as people up here took things seriously, I actually think the fact that San Francisco is is um, is has a massive Asian uh, community probably worked in our favor, right? Because those guys were wearing masks when we all thought it was weird to wear masks. And so they were so ahead of the curve. They know how to live in density and how to not get sick. Uh, in cr- uh, close cramped conditions, places like South Korea and Japan are very lightly affected by this pandemic, even though they were one of the first to get hit before people even knew what was going on. So they were probably wearing masks. And so um, our numbers here, I, I, was, I did the math just recently out of curiosity. If, if we had the same level of, um, of uh, deaths as Los Angeles County, uh, we'd be around, San Francisco would be around 5,000 dead instead of 200, right? So it's a dramatic difference between Northern California, uh, particularly the Bay Area and Southern California. Uh, And I think a lot of it, obviously, it's cultural. And I think there's more Republicans down there in uh, not not L.A. proper, but in the surrounding counties. But just people are irresponsible, young people just being stupid. And the problem is, even now that we're especially now that we're so close to a to a (laughs) to our uh, to being vaccinated to herd immunity, we may have herd immunity by the end of April. That's how close we are to uh, to actually being starting to get back to normal. And it looks like we may have full adult vaccination by the end of May. That's where the numbers are going right now. So it's a couple of months. We got two months left. And so um, people are being dumb. And what happens is that every time this virus transmits, it gives an opportunity to mutate. That's the problem. You know, at this point, it's not even... Are you young and you're not going to be that affected because you're young and healthy? Uh, okay, but you know what you're doing is you're allowing this virus to mutate. And there's a sort of nightmare scenario that if the California variant, which is very um, transmissible, and the South African one, which is actually proving to be resistant to some degree against vaccines, if those guys were to sort of hang out together and and, and sort of become this evil um mutant variant uh, it could be disastrous right because then we may have to go back to square one and close things down again so people need to be responsible and that that irresponsibility from republicans from donald trump to young people who insist on going out and partying instead of realizing that this is actually 
a, uh, a serious epidemic with serious consequences. Um, and if you're young and in college, what job are you going to graduate to if the economy is decimated because the stupid virus keeps mutating and evading vaccines, right? So this is serious stuff and it's frustrating. And, and it didn't have to be that way. And here I am in, in our little Bay Area bubble where things are actually kind of chill and calm and, and because people are taking it seriously and are being responsible. You don't see people without masks out in the street. Even if you're walking by yourself with nobody around you for 50 feet, people have masks on. That's this culture here. No, that's good and, and very important and, and glad people are doing that uh, for their own uh, safety and um, protection. Uh, also had a conversation recently with with Jason Furman, who was in the Obama and White House, and, and he's advocating that Biden and his plans make immigrants whole because uh, many of them are essential workers in this pandemic crisis. And if you make them whole, that, too, helps the economy. So we talk about California, we talk about United 11. We're talking about a lot of immigrant workers. Uh, who need to be taken into consideration. Uh, I'm sure you heard about the legislation. Again, uh, the governor wouldn't sign it at first. Um, returning those who were first hired, first fired back to employment. But, you know, that's the economic part of this too, Marcos. I mean, we got to solve the vaccine, but we also have to solve the economy. You can't really do that unless those immigrants are, are back at work, making a living wage, uh, and being able to do so with protections, right? I mean, that's the the humane and it's the policy, right policy prescription. I mean, I don't know what an alternative you have to that situation. And uh, it's, it's amazing being a liberal. It's actually in a lot of ways it's liberating because good policy is good politics. And a lot of times convincing Democrats of that has been the big challenge. Um, and so Democrats have often been afraid to do the popular thing because, oh, no, what are Republicans going to say about us? Or, and, I mean, I'm, I'm, we're seeing that that's becoming less and less of an issue as, as not only as, as, Democrats, as Democrats win more and as uh, uh, we sort of, you know, we flushed out a lot of the deadweight from the party, right? The Ben Nelsons and the Joe Liebermans. And so you have a better Democratic Party already to begin with. But just sort of realizing that, that, now those Democrats have support. In the past, they didn't, right? They'd get beat up by Fox News, and there was really no alternative. And even, you know, Daily Coast has only been around for uh, eight, 18, 19 years, which seems like a long time. But in the scheme of media world, right, it, it's been a long time since Democrats had had real massive support. And now they have that with, with social media, with Twitter and Facebook. It's a little, it's a different, it's a different environment. And so good politics is good policy and vice versa. And, and so I don't know why you would oppose something like that because um, those immigrants have voting family members, people who are legal, their their coworkers, their family members. I mean, this is not a closed universe. And just because they're not documented or, or they're not U.S. citizens, uh, they're not engaged politically. They absolutely are engaged politically. This is a new world we're in now. And so making sure that our people are taken care of, I'm paying attention. I'm definitely paying attention uh, uh, because those are my people. And so, yeah, absolutely. I don't, it seems like a no-brainer to me. It, to me, it's like, you know, you're, the child tax credit argument you're making. I mean, and even in terms of, of keeping the party strong and viable and building it, that's what you do. Um, and that's that's merciful and it's necessary. Uh, your thoughts on the uh, what? Now, let me do this first. Near a tandem. What do you, yeah. what do you think? Is, is that? Is I that think she's great. I think she's incredibly well qualified. And oh, no, she said some mean tweets. You know, you have a Republican that spent four years pretending they didn't know what Twitter was. I, I don't read Twitter. I didn't see any any tweets. And now they're going to be all outraged and and. Uh, and having the vapors because somebody used Twitter, I mean, to say something mean about somebody else. I mean, it's patently absurd. And they did it to Deb Halan, too, you know, um, in the uh, Secretary of Interior, um, uh, what do you call it, the, the hearings, right, where they were like, oh, you said that Republicans don't believe in science. They don't. <laughs> I mean, first of all, truth is a defense, objectively so. 
But beyond that, are we really going to pretend now that a mean tweet is is something that's disqualifying after they spent four years pretending that Donald Trump's Twitter Twitter account did not exist? Like I, it's you know, just like they're starting to pretend to care about the deficit again. I mean, this stuff is just absolutely ridiculous. And and I got to say, Mark, in the past they would have gotten traction with it, and I'm not getting the sense that they're getting much. Republicans are getting much traction now. They're still playing off this playbook where where they can get the media and Democrats all, you know, hyperventilating about bipartisanship. And, you know, that, that ship is sailed. Nobody cares anymore, uh, particularly when you look at bipartisanship. You redefine it the way Joe Biden has as the American people. And things like the relief bill are is legitimately bipartisan. And because Republicans, if you ask Republicans rank and file, they agree with it. The child tax credit. I bet you QAnon people are going to agree with that one, right? I mean... They're going to have a choice in 2022 whether to vote for for you know a Republican or lose their you know vote for a Republican and lose their check, or or stick with or stick with the Democrats and, and keep getting those those child credit t- checks every month. So um, delivering for people is going to be critical. People actually like it, and Mitch McConnell no longer gets to decide what's bipartisan anymore, and that I think makes it different. Doesn't mean they're not going to be hypocritical because they are, just like with Neera Tandon. But uh, I think they're getting a lot less traction with it now. Is it that? How much of it, too, though, is um, Bernie and his supporters? Because a lot of tweets were directed at him. I mean, it's part of it. But the opposition really in, in, in the Senate right now is from uh, it's from uh, Republicans and Joe Manchin. I mean, there's there's no. And you know why Joe Manchin is pissed? Because what? she, because because his daughter is a big pharma exec, and she, in near attendant, actually criticized her for, I forget what exactly, but it was some big pharma screw people over okay. deal. So I, apparently he's he's taking it personally, but none of I mean is has even Bernie Sanders said he's not going to vote for her. I don't think so, but you yeah, know he, something. He's he's been quiet, uh, but some people think you know I mean his supporters often go beyond him. And so yeah, that, but uh, um, they're not a factor. In fact, I think a lot of those the 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 sort of the really strident Bernie crowd is is almost self disqualifying in a way that that their politics are kind of a joke and they're easy to dismiss because there's no sense of proportionality or uh, or or reality in in a lot of that. And I know I know that crowd hates me a lot because I'll say stuff like that. But um, politics is the art of what's possible within a given environment. So to me, what's important is making future, you know, it's making progress and moving things forward and not going for the pony that's, you know, that it's just, just not going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. No, I hear you. That's a good point. Um, the hearings on the insurrection. Um, what, what was your takeaway from that this week? I mean, obviously we'll stipulate Ron Johnson as a fool. Yeah, I was going to say, my takeaway is I can't wait for 2022. <laughs> because Ron Johnson is going to be public enemy number one. I can't imagine another Republican that's going to be more heavily targeted than than he is. I can't believe he's still going on with the big lie. Um, on that front, there's this, there's this talk about a commission, right? Like a 9-11 style commission. And um, you already have... You already have uh, Kevin McCarthy saying that that uh, putting up roadblocks, right? He doesn't want Trump to be part of it. He doesn't want Republicans being considered, you know, being part of that discussion. And again, I, you know, you had this sort of desire for bipartisanship that they're playing to. And I hope Nancy Pelosi and, and the Democrats don't buy it. I hope they say, all right, you know, we're going to have a bipartisan commission, but uh, Mitch McConnell and Kevin McCarthy aren't going to be the ones who decide what Republicans are on that commission because you can absolutely have a bipartisan 50-50 commission with Republicans that aren't bought into the insurrection sedition uh, of the modern Republican Party. So that's what I would do if I was the Democrats and just quit trying to play this. Uh, Kevin McCarthy and Mitch McConnell don't get to talk about bipartisanship, not when they enabled and uh, I continue to enable the big lie in this insurrection that we, we just suffered through. What do you make of the evidence um, so far that 
the Pentagon and those at the Pentagon were resistant to the National Guard coming to the Capitol as, as if it had almost some of the languages was said at the hearing. I mean, none of this has been proven yet, but the, the implication is that there were those at the Pentagon who didn't want the Capitol to be protected. Um, yeah. And just I, let I it Yeah. I don't think there's any doubt. And like, like you said, I mean, we still don't have proof yet, right? This is all preliminary uh, information, but there was a reason that Donald Trump was purging the Pentagon and the intelligence agencies after he lost. I mean, he was he was he was putting his people, he was putting Devin Nunes's people into positions of leadership in both the Pentagon and and uh, the CIA, I believe, too, because um, they were trying to push Haskell out. They're trying to push. I mean, they were they were they were setting the pieces in place for a coup. And we saw it happen. Like it wasn't, we saw it happen in real time. It, it wasn't behind closed doors. And, and there was zero reason for Trump to be making personal moves after he lost. The only thing he should have been focused on at that point was transition. Instead, he didn't only stymie the transition, but he worked to move his, his partisan loyalists, not Republicans, not conservatives, but Trumpkins, right? people loyal to him, the individual, into positions of authority in places like the Pentagon. So it makes absolute sense that then the Pentagon would do its best to, to further the, uh, the insurrection by refusing to send aid. Uh, I mean, there's probably people in the Pentagon that were hoping that Mike Pence would be executed. I don't think there's any doubt that that was the goal. I just can't imagine what they thought that would lead to. I mean, if, if, if people were assassinated, did they think what the Trump would then remain president? I mean, what? <laughs> yeah, they did. They, there was this fantasy uh, fueled by Q that um, that there was this mass of support, the silent majority in the country that would rise up, and that the military would back this this uh, you know this this grab of power and carry Trump back to office. Um, the military, the police, and um, that was the that was that was the idea that there was enough massive popular support in the military and in the country that it would support the coup. Crazy. Yeah, yeah, and and yeah, that's insane. And not even contemplate that if it went that far, there would even be divisions within military authority. I mean, it would just be chaos. But then, you know, I, I think we underestimate the, the, the desire that those have for anarchy too. You know, um, I mean, ultimately these people, they don't really want the government to function. So even if it went to a state of anarchy, they probably wouldn't mind that. It, yeah. You kill the vice president, kill the speaker of the house and case rah, rah, as long as there's anarchy. That's a great point, and that's that's a differentiation between you know the, the Trumpy, hidden, deplorable types and old school Republicans, right? Because old school Republicans actually they they want power for a reason. They want power for lower taxes and to get goodies for their corporate friends, right? I mean, there's there's a rationale behind them wanting to to win control. The Trump supporters they're nihilists. They just want they their lives suck. They have no hope. Their jobs have been shipped off to to other countries. They are their counties are addict. You know, it's meth addiction is is rampant and opiate addiction. There are no prospects of any turnaround economically. I mean, they are living in some real crap conditions. And they look at people, uh, mostly liberals. They live in cities. The cities are prohibitively expensive to anybody who isn't educated, who doesn't have maybe some means already. And so it's like a gated community and they're on the outs. And so they just want to burn stuff down. And I always go back to Kelly Loeffler running for, for um, election in Georgia and her ads were comparing herself to Attila the Hun. And I always say there's no Hun civilization. There's no Hun art and culture and philosophy and music. You can't go and visit Hun ruins because they didn't build anything. They destroyed their nihilists. And so very much these people in 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 that were storming the Capitol, they wanted to destroy. I mean, that was that is Trump personified. What I can't fathom 
is why the Republican Party went along with it. Why they didn't, the Democrats handed them a, a gift of an opportunity to cut off that Trump cancer and they refused to do it. That's the part that's, that baffles me. Well, that goes back to what we've been talking about too. Uh, like, it, I mean, maybe that's the motivation of Ron Johnson, this, this other fear of Trump primary them. I mean, still, even when you say that out loud, when I say that out loud, but you had an opportunity to vanquish him forever. So he couldn't primary, but you didn't do it. But is, is that what, what Ron Johnson's deal is? Is, is he? No, Ron Johnson's a true believer, right? I mean, he spent 4th of July in Russia with Putin. So he, he's, he's, uh, he belongs to Putin, uh, just like Donald Trump did. Um, he is a hundred percent one of them. Um, it is, it is. So obviously if you cut, Trump off, you have a rebellion in the party. You're in, you're going to be in the wilderness for a couple of cycles. It's it's just inevitable. You're going to be in a wilderness. On the other hand, right now you stick with Trumpism. You're sticking with a base that is older, whiter, and literally dying off in huge numbers. Rural America is dying. Gun gun ownership. The number of guns sold is record high. The number of gun owners keeps going down. So it's just a smaller group of people buying more and more guns from paranoia. But that culture is a dying culture. It's it's going away and it's being replaced, obviously, by younger, browner, uh, people less likely to get married, uh, more far more liberal. I mean, you look at these the millennials are are liberal, and then you look at the the Zoomers, they're like another level of of, of liberal, right? And they are making you know, they're going in with a with with voters that may not even turn out without Trump on the ballot. I mean, they didn't. Their numbers were significantly lower in the Georgia runoff. Uh, and so this idea that you're going to you're going to that you're going to survive without Trump on the ballot by appealing to Trump voters who are not Republicans, they're nihilists, they just want to burn stuff down. And unless you're talking about burning stuff down, they they're probably not interested. So I think like in Marjorie Taylor Greene or a, or a Bobert, they might be interested in, right? Cuz they're nihilist Q burn stuff down. But but um, other Republicans, I, I, I suspect, and I may be overly optimistic, but I suspect that we're going to, we're going to, we're going to see a 2022 midterm election that defies historical president, which always says that the party in power loses seats in Congress, party in power in the White House loses seats in Congress. I actually think it's going to be the other way around because Republicans made their bed with a group of people that I suspect aren't going to even turn out and vote in 2022. Yeah, that, that that that's interesting. What was up with Purdue? He was threatening to run again, and then he decided not to. What do you think that was all about? I actually suspect that he's afraid of a of a challenge from the right from Mar- Marjorie Taylor Greene, which would be really fascinating because he was Trumpy all the way to the end. I mean, he was a Trump loyalist through and through. Uh, but even he didn't feel comfortable. Or it could be as simple as he can see the math. He can see what happened in a runoff. How is he going to make better numbers than that? Like, how is he going to make up that deficit? He lost by by uh, what did he lose by eighty thousand votes? Um, how is he going to how is he going to close that gap in in two years? Ask his base. Like I said, it's not just that they may not even turn out and vote. A lot of them are just going to die, and they're not going to be around to vote. And so, and you have somebody in the Reverend um, Warnock that really really drives turnout amongst black. Georgians, which has always been sort of the weak point in the Democratic Party in Georgia, they're turning out for him. They did already, and I don't see them stopping because he's effing fantastic. So, and I mean, it goes even beyond, like, I don't understand why they're all refusing to support the uh, the $1.9 trillion COVID relief package. I mean, it boggles the mind, and they're, they're threatening that not a single Republican is going to vote for it. And they're playing off that old playbook that we were talking about, that desire by Democrats to be bipartisan for the sake of bipartisanship, not because it's better policy or better politics, just because I don't know the Washington Post editorial board would be like nice to them or something. I don't, I don't get it. Yeah, that's it. But, but what it does is it, it, I hope not a single one votes for it. I bet you they chicken out. I bet a bunch vote for it, but I hope none of them vote for it because I want 2022 to be a clear difference between the party that helped you out when COVID was decimating our economy and the party that literally wanted to give you zero because they voted no on everything. Did you say Marjorie Taylor Greene might run? Yeah. Uh, 
Yeah. Oh my god. Yeah. I mean, I th- I think Warnock would crush her, but oh yeah, I mean that would be good. I mean, <laughs> yes, yeah. but uh, that I I suspect that's what Purdue was afraid of. I can't imagine. Otherwise, he'd say like, "My family's moving on," or I mean, there's other ways. It, he just after the election was over, he was talking about running again, and suddenly he wasn't. And yeah. what changed? Yeah, right. That's right. That's right. Folks, check out the brief. Weekly, and it's also a YouTube show as well. Be sure to check it out with Marcos Melitsis of Daily Coast and Civics with a Q. Thanks as always, Marcos. Appreciate you, buddy. Appreciate you too. Thank you so much. Have a great week. And everybody, please wear your masks and stay safe. We're almost out of the woods. Don't get sick now. Oh, wait. I'm sorry. I forgot. We haven't talked since Ted Cruz went to Mexico, right? <laughs> no. <laughs> so let me give you the, let's let you close with, you know, share your favorite Ted Cruz jokes, memes, or whatever. Take a shot. Let's take a shot at Ted Cruz. Right I, here. I, I don't have any, I don't have any jokes, <laughs> but I, he's just so lucky he's not up for re-election next year because he would be toast at this point. He, uh, He's on borrowed time. And this is, this is one of those scandals that's going to stick. I mean, each, four years from now, Beto's going to run against him, hopefully. I mean, maybe Beto runs yeah, Beto's probably going to run for him unless he runs for governor. Yeah. And uh, and he, Ted Cruz, you know, he only held on by two points, by two points last time. Wow. And it's going to be an even more Democratic electorate when he's up for re-election in four years. And uh, he's he's toast. And how do you blame your children? He literally well, threw his own children. That's a grown man, a he, big fat man, by the way, who's been eating, eating obviously eating children and cows. <laughs> He 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 threw his own children under the bus. I mean, he's a guy where where Donald Trump called his wife ugly, and he just shrugged it off. And Donald Trump said his dad was a mass murderer, and he shrugged it off. I mean, this is not a guy that really stands by his family. It's absolutely. I got to tell you, anybody calls my partner ugly, and I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. Like, <laughs> right, right, right. Well, a uh, uh, correction. See, and I went. I had a flashback on that because that was a, a, a favorite moment of mine. He, did, Trump, did not call his dad a mass murder. He asked him, "Is that your father?" <laughs> In the picture, remember? And and Ted is so <laughs> stupid. He wouldn't answer the question. He went to and nobody said my father assassinated JFK. And even the press like, "Oh, dude, we didn't ask you that. We didn't try to get to. We're doing this one step at a time." Is that your daddy? In the picture, and he went to straight defense. My father didn't kill. I mean, it was almost like he was admitting it by trying to defend, not answering the right question. Remember, he dropped out. That's what dropped yeah. out. You know, I, I think I told the story about how <laughs> I'm with Beto and I interview him. We're face to face in Texas. Where are we in San Antonio? I think it was during the campaign. And I love to agitate staff just for, for laughs. And Beto's like, Mark, what do you think I should do? I said, bring up his father in JFK. And the staff was like, no, no, <laughs> we don't win. They didn't win it. <laughs> but Beto was feeling it. He's like, yeah, yeah. I just think about it. He dropped out. And again, be smart. Don't make a wild accusation. Just ask a fun, the question that everybody wants to know. Is that your father or not in the picture? And the, the, the more he doesn't answer it, he's toast. But staff was like, you know, they got mad at me. Mark, you can't be saying it because he'll go out and say it and we won't be able to control it. I said, but seriously. That, that's a valid question. <laughs> if, I, if my father was in the picture with Lee Harvey Oswald or your father, Mark, was in the picture, we, we would have to answer that question forever unless, until we came up with a better answer. Why should Ted get a pass? And remind you, you have not seen or heard from his father since. I think he was even a, a, a televangelist or something on YouTube. You don't even see him anymore. He literally vanished from the face yeah. of the earth. But I couldn't help but think about that while he's walking through the airport. What has he been eating to? Everybody out here has lost their jobs, starving in the pandemic. He has gained weight in, in COVID. They're going to go chill at the Ritz Carlton in Mexico during Texas's worst catastrophe, and who knows how long <laughs> this one's going to stick. Mark, it's not going anywhere. Yeah, yeah. He, who was uh, that? To? I was talking to my cousin Cliff Kelly, the talk show host in Chicago. You, you know what it reminds me of? Jane Byrne. Harold Washington did not only become the first black mayor of Chicago because of a 30 year campaign to make it. So it was a lot of hard work. But Jane Byrne helped because there was a blizzard in Chicago. That, oh, yeah. And she didn't pick up the snow. Yep. Ted, there's the worst 
environmental disaster, in, in, in electrical disaster in Texas history. And he goes on vacation yep. to Mexico where, <laughs> <With the Ritz. laughs> where we don't even, okay. not even, not even an Airbnb. I, it, no, the Ritz. I mean, this is, it, it, the ads, you don't even need to write the ads. You just run the memes again. Remind everybody with all the memes. And now those, those children, I mean, you're the adult. You're supposed to save, spare the children. I said, no, y'all, we shouldn't do that. Now those children are going to be reminded of that when they go back to school and for the rest of their lives. Yeah, you're the kids that took a hike while the rest of us were sinking <laughs> with no Dang. with no uh, heat, no water, no electricity. Maybe, maybe they go to a private school with a bunch of rich kids and they all think it's hilarious or something. Who knows? Yeah. But um, I just, I'm, I'm done with Cruz. I think he's done in a Republican primary. I, I don't, I think this hurts him on both sides. Like it, this is not just a partisan attack line. I mean, I think this really damaged him, period. And uh, so his presidential ambitions are done. Yeah, yeah. And you know, everybody hates Ted, right? So nobody right. defended him. Yeah. Nobody yeah. defended him. Yeah. You notice that, right? Other yeah. people get defended. That's true. No, I nobody can't, rose to his I defense. I can't think of a soul who weighed in at all. Everybody just kind of. I mean, other than Hannity, all. yeah, Sean Hannity did. But I mean, any Republicans, like they all, like Abbott, all the Republicans in Texas, Nobody defended him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jay Cruz. No. Okay. Thanks, <laughs> right. Ghost. Have a great weekend. Bye bye. <laughs> you too. Thanks for getting woke and listening to Make It Plain. Please remember to listen, like, subscribe, and wherever you get your podcasts, please give the show a five star rating. And please do spread the word. Let's all continue to pray for each other during this pandemic and this police demic. If all hearts and minds are clear, it has been Made Plain. Nice buns, soft, fluffy, and ultra low net carbs. Discover Hero Bread, the delicious ultra low net carb bread with incredible taste and texture. Hero Bread has zero grams of sugar and is under 100 calories per serving, plus high in fiber with 5 to 10 grams of protein per serving. Available on Amazon.com, Walmart.com, and at hero.co. That's H E R O.co. Delicious ultra low net carb Hero Bread buns and tortillas. Soft and fluffy, high in fiber, and with zero grams of sugar, up to 10 grams of protein, coming in at under 100 calories. Order today at Hero.co and use the code AH10 to get 10% off your first purchase. That's AH10 at Hero.co, H-E-R-O dot C-O. Order from Hero.co now and get 10% off your first purchase with promo code AH10. That's 10% off with code AH10, H-E-R-O dot C-O.